Okay, now we're going to move on and talk about bradyarrhythmias specifically. Due to time, we won't have time to discuss sinus arrest, sinus bradycardia, or sinus arrhythmia. However, I do want to mention that sinus bradycardia is never normal in a cat in the hospital. When we see a sinus bradycardia in a cat in the ER, the two biggest and fastest rule outs we have are hyperkalemia and sepsis. Sinus arrhythmia is also never normal in cats. It can be normal in dogs, but it's never normal in cats. The three bradyarrhythmias we'll cover are sick sinus syndrome. It is also called bradycardia tachycardia syndrome, atrial standstill, and heart block. Sick sinus syndrome used to be considered a disease of middle-aged miniature schnauzers. However, it has subsequently been found in Cocker Spaniels, West Highland White Terriers, and many, many different mixed breeds. So it is a disease of any dog. It also used to be thought to only be the sinus, that the SA node that was affected. And now it's known to be disease of the SA node, the AV node, the junction, the bundle branches, and cardiac tissue at all levels. This is a, a, an ECG from a dog with sick sinus syndrome. What you can see, if you look at lead two, which is in the center, you see some relatively normal looking beats, upright and narrow QRS complexes, and they're followed by a very, very long pause. This is a sinus arrest where nothing is happening. Now, the way that we know that it is more than the SA node that is affected here is that we should have had the AV node kick in by now. This is a very lengthy pause, and at this point, the AV node, had it been normal, would have kicked in with some escape beats. And even, potentially, the Purkinje's are abnormal because they may have kicked in by now. This is a kind of a sinus arrest that would very likely cause a dog to pass out or have a syncopal episode. Sick sinus syndrome is thought to be a, about antibodies against nodal tissue. At least this is what's been found in humans. It hasn't been documented in dogs, but this is what the suspicion is. It is a, an occurrence of sinus bradycardia, sinus arrest or flatline, and supraventricular tachycardia. So often what you'll see is there'll be a period of bradycardia or sinus arrest, and that will be followed by tachycardia. So this is more appropriately called bradycardia tachycardia syndrome. And it's important to keep that in mind because the bradycardia tachycardia syndrome tells you that treating the bradycardia will make tachycardia worse and vice versa. And we'll talk about that more in treatment. So the treatment for uh, sick sinus syndrome is a permanent artificial pacemaker. That is the ideal treatment. Drugs such as atropine or isoproterenol do not work well. They're usually not successful at all. And then drugs that treat the bradycardia will make the tachycardia worse and vice versa. Theophylin is thought to potentially reduce the length of the sinus arrest and may be helpful while waiting for a pacemaker. All right, now we're going to move on and talk about atrial standstill. Atrial standstill occurs when a sinus impulse is formed in the SA node and it's conducted to the AV node but not, the, not causing the atria to contract. So it goes to the AV node, and then the AV node kicks in, the, goes down the bundle of Hiss, the impulse goes down the bundle of Hiss, and the Purkinje fibers kick in, and we get a normal-looking impulse, but the, the atria never contracted. So we call that a sinoventricular rhythm. It's faster than the ventricular rate because it's, the activation is coming from the SA node, which is faster than the Purkinje's. With atrial standstill, the QRS is usually normal looking, so it's usually upright and narrow. The one exception would be bundle branch block or when the, there's disease at other levels of the heart, so the AV node, the bundle of Hiss, are affected. In that case, we could get a wide and bizarre QRS. The SA node continues to fire, impulses are transmitted to the AV junction, and we will not see a P wave. So the atrial myocardium is not activated, so we have no P wave. It is seen with atrial disease, so enlarged atria or cardiomyopathy, 
inherited atrial myopathy in that scene in English Springer Spaniels and also with hyperkalemia. Here's an example of atrial standstill. Lead 2 is in the center. And what you can see are that there are no P waves. We have a relatively upright and narrow QRS complex. And then we have a wide and tall T wave. The tall and wide T wave suggests that this atrial standstill may be due to hyperkalemia. So the treatment for atrial standstill is a permanent pacemaker if it, the disease is both clinical, so the animal is clinical for the bradycardia, and it's permanent, so some kind of tissue infiltration. In that case, the pacemaker is ideal. If the disease is temporary, so for instance, hyperkalemia, we treat the underlying cause. Now, atropine will not help at all because it won't make the atria contract, and so we don't use atropine. And now we're going to talk about heart block. So heart block can be broken up into first, second, and third degree heart block, or AV block. First degree AV block is where all beats get through the AV node. They're just delayed. Second degree AV block is where some beats make it through and some don't. And then third degree AV block is where no beats get through the AV node. In first degree AV block, we have a delay in the impulse conduction through the AV node. The rate and the rhythm are normal. The P wave and the QRS are normal looking. And the PR interval is prolonged. So greater than 0.13 seconds in the dog and greater than 0.09 seconds in the cat. So here we have a normal sinus rhythm on the left and a first degree AV block on the right. And what you can see when you're looking at the PR interval on the left, it's normal, and on the right, it's delayed. So we have a prolonged PR interval, meaning that conduction is delayed through the AV node. Causes of a, a first degree AV block are drugs, different drugs, digoxin, beta blockers, procainamide. Low dose atropine can prolong it initially, the PR interval, and then uh, eventually it speeds things up. It, we can sometimes see it in older patients and we don't generally treat this. So it does not cause any perfusion abnormalities and it's not treated. Now second degree AV block is broken up into Mobitz type one, and Mobitz type 2. Mobitz type 1 is also called winky back. Mobitz type 1 is much more similar to first degree AV block in that we don't treat it and we're not very concerned. Mobitz type 2 is much more similar to third degree AV block in that we are very concerned and we usually do treat. So second degree AV block Mobitz type 1 is a progressive elongation of the PR interval until we get a blocked P wave. The P waves are normal, the QRS configuration is normal, and the ventricular rate will be a little slower than the atrial rate due to the blocked P waves. We're looking at the image on the left, and this is a second degree AV block Mobitz type 1. What you can see is we have a normal PR interval to the extreme left, and then the PR interval becomes prolonged and then even more long or pro more prolonged. And then we have no R wave following a P wave. So we have a blocked P wave. With Mobitz type 2, the frequency and severity of the arrhythmia is usually much more intense. P waves are not followed by QRS complexes and the P wave conformation is usually normal. With uh, Mobitz type 2, the PR intervals are usually constant. The QRS can be normal or abnormal. If the block occurs below the bundle of Hiss, we will often have a wide and bizarre QRS. Here we're looking at the image on the right. This is a second degree AV block, Mobitz type 2. And what we can see is we have a normal PR interval to the left of the figure and then we have a dropped P wave. We have a P that is not followed by a QRS. Then we have a normal P, QRS, T, and then another dropped P. This is Mobitz type two, second degree AV block. With Mobitz type two, second degree AV block, we usually have a fixed relationship between the atria and the ventricles. 
So there can be one ventricular beat for every two P waves. That would be a one to two. There could be one ventricular beat for every four P waves, and that would be a one to four. As the numbers progress, the arrhythmia is more severe and the heart rate will be slower because we're having many, many P waves before any QRS kicks in. So we'll have a very slow ventricular rate. So for second degree AV block, for Mobitz type 1, that can be normal in young dogs. And we can also see it from increased vagal tone. Again, type 1 is not something we usually worry about. We usually don't treat it. Now, second degree AV block Mobitz type 2 can be seen with disease. So myocarditis, cardiac neoplasia, and the hereditary stenosis of the bundle of his in pugs. We can see second degree AV block in cats. That is usually cats with diseased hearts, so hypertrophic cardiomyopathy cats. We can sometimes see it with hyperthyroidism in cats, and we can see it with microscopic idiopathic fibrosis in older dogs. Also, we can see many, many drugs causing uh, second degree AV block. So when we have the Mobitz type two, second degree AV block Mobitz type two, especially if we have a very slow ventricular rate and a wide bizarre QRS, this can quickly degenerate into third degree AV block and we often either watch it very closely or go ahead and treat. When we have Mobitz type two, second degree AV block, if we have too many P waves not making it through the AV node, we will get a wide bizarre ventricular escape complex. This can easily, again, degenerate into third degree AV block. And when the heart rate is that slow, it often affects perfusion. And so the dog will be uh, quiet or lethargic or in some cases syncopal. So this needs to be treated. So how do we treat? We can try atropine and glycopyrrolate um, and isoproterenol. In general, they're not very successful at all. We sometimes try them just to get the dog through to uh, pacemaker, but the only definitive treatment really is pacemaker. Here we can see an example of second degree AV block, Mobitz type two. In the middle lead, we can see lead two, and we can see that we have multiple P waves without any QRS complex after them. So we can count one, two, three, four at the blue arrows, and the fourth one has a QRS after it. So this would be four to one, or one QRS to every four complexes. And you can see that we have a very slow ventricular rate because of this. All right, now moving on to third degree AV block. For third degree, there's no correlation between P waves and QRS complexes. There's no conduction occurring between the atria and the ventricles. <clears throat> the P to P interval is normal, or relatively constant, and the R to R intervals are relatively constant. And what that means is that the atria are beating, the, the SA node is kicking out, but nothing's making it through the AV node. So we have an SA node rate, and we have an atrial rate, uh, and we'll see those P waves, and that's pretty consistent. The ventricular escape that is coming from the ventricle because it's not getting anything through the AV node will also be constant. So we'll have a constant ventricular rate that's usually quite slow, and that will let us know that we have a third degree AV block. So with third degree AV block, we have an atrial rate or a P wave that's normal. We have a ventricular escape rhythm that is slow. The ventricular rate in dogs can be 20 to 40 beats per minute, depending on where it's coming from in the ventricle. If it's coming from the junction, right below the AV junction, it will often be 40 to 60 in the dog and 80 to 100, even up to 120 in the cat. With third degree AV block, the QRS is usually wide and bizarre. There are exceptions where the impulse is coming from just below the AV node and we end up with an upright and narrow QRS. The QRS is normal, again, if the pacemaker is near the top of the AV junction. Now, an exception is bundle branch block, and this is a confusing concept for a lot of people. So the bundle branches go out uh, right at the bundle of Hiss, and when we have a bundle branch block, even if the impulse is coming from above the AV node, 
we will have a normal traveling impulse, let's say an impulse coming from SA node, down the atria, AV node, down the bundle of Hiss, and at one bundle, one bundle branch, it blocks. When that occurs, we get a wide and bizarre QRS complex. So even though the impulse is coming from above the ventricle, we look like we're coming from the ventricle. So it looks like the impulse is ventricular, and that can be very, very tricky. So here is our uh, heart again, and we see if we have an impulse coming from above the AV node, so if it's coming from the SA node or the AV node, it will travel in the normal direction down the heart and will get an upright and narrow QRS. How, and, and, and alternatively, if the impulse is coming from the ventricle, from the Purkinje fibers, we will have a wide and bizarre QRS. The exception is when we have an impulse coming from above the ventricle, so we have an SA node impulse or an AV node impulse, but as it travels down the bundle of Hiss, one of the bundle branches is blocked. That causes our configuration to be wide and bizarre, and we get what looks like an impulse coming from the ventricle, but it's really coming from above the ventricle. So causes of third-degree AV block include congenital defects, digoxin toxicity, it has to be pretty severe, and idiopathic fibrosis of older dogs, and we see it more commonly in Cocker Spaniels. Other causes of third-degree AV block include myocarditis, Lyme disease, Chagas, and then uh, treatment for third-degree AV block. The only treatment is a pacemaker. Here's an image of third-degree AV block. If you look at lead 2, which is at the very bottom of the strip, you can see multiple P waves without any QRS complex following them. The key here is that, and we do have an upright and narrow QRS, so it looks like the impulse is coming from just below the AV node. Now the key in differentiating this from a second degree AV block is that when we do have a P wave, it is not causing the QRS. In other words, the P to R interval is completely different with every single QRS complex. And that shows us that there's no P causing the QRS. Here is a comparison of two ECGs, one from second degree AV block on the left and one from third degree AV block on the right. The second degree AV block shows lead two in the center and the three arrows are pointing to P waves that are at the exact same PR interval to the QRS, the P and the QRS, exact same PR interval of all three P waves. And this shows us that that P wave caused that QRS. If you look on the right, lead two is on the bottom, and you can see the arrows showing you that the PR interval is completely random and not in any way consistent. And this tells us that the P waves and the, R, the QRS complexes are completely disengaged and there's no connection. And that tells us that that's a third degree AV block. Here's another third degree AV block example. Lead two again is at the bottom. And you can see that we've got four P waves for every QRS complex, roughly four P waves for every QRS complex. And so that would be a one to four uh, ratio. And this would be a slow uh, third degree AV block. Another example of third degree AV block, and we have lead two in the center here. And what we can see is that we have many, many P waves before we get a QRS. When we do see the QRS complex, it is wide and bizarre. And that tells us that the impulse is coming from below the ventricle or below the AV node and from somewhere in the ventricle. So let's take a break for a minute and talk about a case. We have a four-year-old male castrated domestic short hair who was blocked or had urethral obstruction. He had emergency perineal urethrostomy surgery at the veterinarian. And at surgery, he had what appeared to be ventricular tachycardia. So on the ECG machine, he had a wide complex tachycardia, and his heart rate was 260 beats per minute. The question that you want to ponder is what you would do about this. Would you treat this, or would you do something else? 
This is an example of his ECG. Again, we can see lead two is at the bottom, and we have that's our rhythm strip, and we can see that we have a wide complex tachycardia. It looks wide and bizarre and also fast. So the question to ask is whether this is actually ventricular tachycardia or whether it's an escape rhythm. We talked about how an escape rhythm coming from the ventricle will be wide and bizarre. However, escape rhythms are slower than ventricular tachycardia. The question is what is happening at the ECG level? So ECGs will read the highest peak as an R wave. So the tallest amplitude will become an R wave to the ECG. When we have a T wave that is equal to the R wave, it can often double the rate on the ECG. So the ECG is reading the R wave as an R wave and the T wave as a T wave. If we were to listen to the cat, he would have a heart rate of 130 or half of what the ECG is showing. So it's super important whenever you have a cat that you think has VTAC to listen to the cat and get a rate by listening to the heart, not just on the ECG machine. Because what's happening in this cat is he is a block cat with hyperkalemia and he has an escape, so nothing is happening in the top of his heart. His ventricles are beating at an escape beat and if you suppress those, you'll kill him. So let's talk about hyperkalemia. When we have hyperkalemia, we'll often see large peak T waves. We can see small R waves and a prolonged QRS complex. The PR intervals uh, can sometimes be prolonged and we can see se ST segment depression. We can see a smaller and smaller P wave until there is none and a wider and wider QRS and wider or longer PR intervals and eventually we'll see a prolonged QT interval. Now on the right, we see, uh, you'll see letters A through E, and A represents a normal ECG, so we have our P wave, our QRS, and our, our rounded or humped T wave. That's a normal T wave. And on the right, you'll see approximate serum potassium concentration. So there we have a relatively normal concentration of potassium. In B, you can see that the T wave, as the potassium goes up, the T wave becomes pointy or less humped and taller. And you can see that the T wave is becoming almost as tall as the R wave. And this is what we were talking about where when the T and the R are the same, the ECG will read it as two R waves and double the rate. And you can see as we go down, it becomes more bizarre. The complexes become more bizarre. Now, what's important is that we cannot predict. We can have a normal, we, have a cat, we can have a cat with a, a potassium of only six with the wide bizarre complexes, and we can have a cat with a potassium of nine and have relatively normal looking complexes. And that's because calcium, endogenous calcium level, also has a lot to do with whether the potassium is affecting the heart or not. So this is a, a schematic of an action potential. You can see uh, we have resting potential. Our line at the very bottom is resting membrane potential. And the line above that is a threshold required to be able to achieve an action potential. It's called the threshold potential. What you can see is that when we have high potassium, we raise our resting membrane potential and make it easier to get an action potential. When we give calcium, which is one of the treatments for hyperkalemia, we raise our threshold potential. And what we do when we give potassium as a treatment for hyperkalemia is we normalize the difference between resting and threshold. And that generally gives us about 20 to 30 minutes while we unblock the cat, get fluid started, and then bring the potassium down. So for hyperkalemia, the first uh, treatment that we usually use is calcium gluconate 10% slow IV. The reason we use 10% calcium gluconate is that it allows us to memorize the dose in mils.
So the dose is 0 0.5 to 1.5 mils per kg, IV slow. So we usually go right in the middle at 1 mil per kg of calcium gluconate 10%, slow IV, and we never exceed 10 mils in any animal. And we'll give that very slow to effect. Of course, we treat the underlying cause, and we do that while we're getting the calcium uh, pulled up. And then other options include insulin and dextrose and sodium bicarb. Now, insulin dextrose has uh, some pros and cons. One of the cons is that giving insulin to a non-diabetic can be dangerous, so we'll often have to keep them on dextrose for six hours or so after. And that takes away our ability to monitor for hypoglycemia in case the cat becomes septic. Sodium bicarb has some issues where when we treat with sodium bicarb, we will often cause a tetany or a hyper, an ionized hypocalcemia. We'll see clinical signs of so twitching or stiffness of the muscles. If we do use sodium bicarb, we always use it with calcium.